So let me tell you a little bit about autophagy first. So all eukaryotic cells are capable of removing, breaking down, and recycling parts of their own cytoplasm. So basically, they are eating themselves. That's the word autophagy means, self-eating. And during the main pathway of this process, within the cell, within the cytoplasm, a membrane appears that will encircle a part of the cytoplasm, which may include organelles, such as mitochondria. And then they will wrap it into a, a vesicle, kind of like a balloon, filled with all these material that the cell is delivering to the lysosome. And it's the lysosome that has those enzymes, hydrolases, that can break down proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids into um, building blocks. And then it, these are recycled back to the cytosol for, for reuse, for biosynthetic or energy production pathways. And uh, this process can be more or less random, or it can be really specific, for example, for mitochondria. And uh, actually, one of the stimuli uh, inducing autophagy is starvation, when the cells don't have enough food, uh, protein, or, or sugar. So they will start consuming themselves to recycle these constituents. So this gentleman here, Professor Osumi, was the first one who identified genes in yeast that are required for the formation of these autophagic cargo transporting vesicles called autophagosomes. And you know, from a geneticist's point of view, I'm a geneticist. If I would like to study a process, how it works, and how important it is. I have to know the genes behind. Because what I do is I disrupt a gene and look what happens, okay? If I disrupt a gene important for autophagy and I look what happens in animals or even people who have mutations in these genes, I can conclude that this gene important for autophagy is important for whatever phenotype, pathology, disease we see, then probably it's autophagy. The defect of autophagy is causing that disease. So that's why Professor Osumi got the Nobel Prize six years ago, because his breakthrough discoveries in yeast made it possible to study the mechanisms and the importance of autophagy. And it turns out that autophagy defects contribute to cancer, infection, inflammation, neurodegenerative diseases, a lot of things that my colleagues uh, told you about but also aging. And having a little more autophagy is actually good because it keeps your cells functioning better over time. It keeps them kind of stay younger because they break down all these damaged things. So, and coming back to the fact that not eating, starvation, actually boosts autophagy. Please keep this in mind. I know you're hungry, we are before lunch, but actually being hungry is good for you because it boosts autophagy in all of us now who are hungry. And it helps the cells to get rid of all these damaged uh, organelles and proteins and so on. So I'd like to tell you one thing about showing how we approach this problem. So working together with uh, human geneticists who identified uh, two uh, boys in an inbred family in Turkey who inherited uh, homozygous mutations of one of these autophagy genes important for autophagy, autophagosome biogenesis called ATG5. It, it's, it's a point mutation. It just changes one amino acid into another amino acid in this protein. And these, these kids are, are suffering, now they are adults. They are suffering from neurodegeneration, ataxia, and mental retardation. And what we did is we took our favorite animal, fruit flies, called Drosophila, and used gene editing to, to 
create the same amino acid change in ATG5, the same gene in flies that the, these boys have. Mm, and this resulted in neurodegeneration, ataxia, and short lifespan. And actually, so this is how ataxia, the movement disorder, looks like. So normal flies climb happily. This is a negative geotaxis uh, reflex. But the mutant flies uh, don't do much. They are just sitting down on the bottom of this tube. And these flies, it's easier to measure autophagy, of course, in experimental animals, because you can just, you know, take samples from them and analyze. So it turns out that they just have about a, a, a one-third reduction of autophagy, not a complete loss of autophagy. And that's already causing these diseases, these symptoms. So actually, what's happening if you have uh, this misregulated autophagy, and this is especially uh, uh, problematic in neurons, because neurons live long. So you have to care for your neurons much more than for cells that have a short turnover, such as uh, the, the cells lining your gut. Those are replaced in a week, okay? But in your brain, you have your ne neurons living up to 100 years, right? So in neurons, it's very important to turn over and get rid of these uh, damaged organelles and proteins to keep them healthy. And in uh, mice, if they remove disrupt autophagy only in neurons, this is what happens. You can see them in these uh, images. So normally neurons uh, are, look like this in the different parts of the brain. They are they, they are brownish because of a, a reaction that detects ubiquitin. I'll tell you in a bit what ubiquitin does. And look what happens in an autophagy defective uh, uh, brain neurons. You will start to see these clumps, aggregates of ubiquitin, or ubiquitin labeling, uh, filling a lot of the cell, right? So ubiquitin is a breakdown signal. If a protein is damaged, its conformation is not good, it will receive a ubiquitin signal, which will tell the cell to get rid of that protein. Normally, this is done by the so-called proteasome. And the ubiquitin proteasome system was actually discovered by Aaron Chikanover, the first uh, Nobel Prize speaker at this meeting. So this is what was the dogma back then, uh, 15 years ago, that ubiquitination tells the cell to get rid of individual proteins by the proteasome, a degrading machine that gets rid of individual proteins. But it turned out that actually autophagy can also, is also very important in turning over, in breaking down ubiquitinated proteins. And so we did similar studies at the same time. And it, it, it's, it happens in autophagy mutant fruit flies as well. Here I'm just showing an ultrastructural EM electron microscope image. Here is part of a neuron. Here is the nucleus. And here you can see uh, this aggregate of uh, ubiquitinated proteins labeled by these immunogold particles that show you where the ubiquitinated proteins are. And these mice and flies have neurodegeneration, movement disorders, and short lifespan. So, Okay, so how do these ubiquitinated protein aggregates form? That's the first question. The second is, is it important for the disease that these aggregates accumulate in cells? So the formation is uh, through so-called autophagy receptors. These can bind to these ubiquitinated proteins. So those that are labeled for breakdown in the lysosome or in this case. So such autophagy recept receptors, for example, P62, uh, this is a protein, they can bind to the ubiquitinated proteins and form aggregates. And these aggregates then can bind to a protein that's, uh, that's attached to the autoph autophagic membrane. It's called L33 or ATG8. So that's how the autophagosome knows that this is an aggregate that I need to deliver to the lysosome for breakdown. So P62, also called REF2P, has these features. It has an aggregation uh, promoting part 
of the protein. This is just a scheme. On the other end, it has a part that can bind to polyubiquitin, so those proteins that are destined for degradation. And it has a small peptide motif, just eight or nine amino acids. And it uses that to do bind to the autophagy protein, ATG8, on the autophagy membrane. And beautiful studies done by other groups showed that it's enough to, to change these two amino acids here. Tryptophan uh, is labeled by W, isoleucine is labeled by I. And if you just change these two amino acids into other amino acids, then the binding of this autophagy receptor to the autophagy protein is lost. So this is the amount of the normal binding. There is hardly any binding in this uh, point mutant. So the, this gave us motivation to use gene editing to put these two amino acid changes in the Drosophila gene and that's coding the Drosophila P62. And by, by this, we disrupted its binding to the autophagy protein, so it's no longer delivered to the lysosome for degradation. And you'll see what happens. So this is the normal level of this P62 protein. And this, in this point mutant, which is not uh, degraded by autophagy, there's an amazing accumulation, as expected. But, but this lot of P62 shows no binding to, to this autophagy protein whatsoever. In the wild type, there is quite a bit of binding. And in the brain, you can also see that all these uh, ubiquitinated protein aggregates accumulate in the, in the point mutant, not in the normal flies. And it turns out that these flies are fine. They are viable, they are fertile, there is no movement disorder, there is no neurodegeneration. The lifespan is a little bit shorter. But it seems that flies can really easily cope with this accumulation of ubiquitinated proteins. And actually a lot of these uh, protein aggregates are, uh, are seen in various neurodegeneration dis uh, disorders, and many of these are, uh, contain ubiquitinated proteins. So many people, researchers, thought that it's the aggregates that are causing the disease. And here we showed that actually the aggregates are well tolerated. So maybe the cells just use these to pack away the toxic proteins so that they can function normally. Uh, this we actually just published uh, last month. Now, coming to the importance of non-autophagic roles of autophagy genes. So, if I'm a geneticist, I disrupt a gene important for autophagy, and if I see a change in, a, in the mutant animal, I can conclude that this is because of an autophagy defect. Now, if a gene has multiple functions. For example, it functions in autophagy and it also functions in something else, another process. That's, that can lead you mistakes when you do not interpret your results properly. So we removed uh, a gene encoding another autophagy protein called ATG9 and um, surprisingly, ATG9 mutant flies, the females were sterile. The males were fertile, and that was a surprise because flies lacking most other ATG genes are female fertile. So in this mutant, these animals lay practically no embryos, eggs. So what's special about ATG9? Probably it's not autophagy then, right? So we looked where this protein is in the ovary because the female mutant flies are, are, are uh, lethal. So we looked where normally the protein is. And it shows small punctae and also labels the plasma membranes between the cells. So then we took a higher uh, magnification using a technique called correlative light and electron microscopy. When we take a look at the, that the localization of a protein, and then we go to the electron microscope and get a much higher resolution. And here in red, you can see where the fluorescent protein is. And here, in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, on uh, an autophagic vesicle. But also, we can see it uh, at the end of these protrusions that are present between those cell, two cells. So it's basically like when you 
put your finger into a balloon, it will cr create a protrusion. And this is stabilized by uh, so-called actin filaments. These are cytoskeleton. And the ATG9 is sitting act actually at the tip of this protrusion. So it might do something with the, cytos with the actin cytoskeleton, right? So but when, then we looked at how these actin filaments look in normal and uh, autophagy mutant ovaries. So in normal ovaries, you can see this very nice fan-shaped organization of the actin filaments in the ovary. And the formation of these fan-shaped actin filaments is delayed in ATG9 mutants. So you don't see the fans at this stage. But there is no change if you look at an, uh, uh, the ovary of another autophagy gene mutant fly, suggesting that there is something special about ATG9. And in fact, that in fact, we found that the protein binds to known regulators of the actin cytoskeleton called ENA and uh, profilin. And indeed, when we sensitize uh, these flies and look what happens in the ovary. So in control flies, you can see these nice big cells. There is one big bl blue nucleus within each cell. In ATG9 mutant ovaries, you can see that sometimes uh, there are two nuclei within one cell because it's the actin cytoskeleton that stabilizes the pl plasma membrane. It's uh, the so-called cortical actin network. And when we remove one copy of these interaction partners of ATG9, so heterozygosity for ENA and profilin, all of a sudden we start to see cells which have four or even more nuclei. So these work together, this is what it suggests. So this paper was published two years ago. And now I'm coming to the paper that uh, was the basis of this award, but I kind of, I like to look at this as, as kind of a uh, lifetime award for, for achievements. So I also talked about other uh, studies. Now this is about the non autophagic role of ATG8 homologs in flies. ATG8 is the protein that is attached to the autophagic membranes, as I told you. And this is a ubiquitin-like protein. There is a glycine near the C terminus. And the protein, ATG8 proteins, gets cleaved to, to free up this glycine. And then this glycine is covalently bound to a lipid. And this lipid tail will anchor the protein into the autophagic membrane, right? So that's why it's there, because it's lipidated and it's required for its, its role in autophagy. So then um, there are two homologs of ATG8 in flies called 8A and 8B. So first I I'll tell you a little bit about ATG8A. We generated two mutations in ATG8A. In one, we remo removed the protein coding se sequence. In the other one, we just changed this glycine into a stop codon using gene editing. And as you can see, both mutants disrupt autophagy. So these are homozygous mutant cells, those that have no red color, in a genetically mosaic animal. So we can create animals when certain, gene, certain cells lack uh, the gene, homozygous mutant, while other cells are heterozygous. So they have the wild type gene. And as you can see, only in the homozygous mutant cells, you will see the accumulation of P62 and ubiquitinated protein containing aggregates, but not, not in the sur surrounding heterozygous tissue. So this is the, the full gene mutant, and this is the glycine to stop mutant. In both cases, there is the same amount of ubiquitinated protein aggregates. So both disrupt autophagy. And when we look at the histolysis of uh, larval intestine, because the larva, the, the fruit-fried larva, rebuilds it, its body during metamorphosis. From a head, leg, and wingless larva, there will emerge an adult fly with head, legs, and wings. So it remodels the, the midgut as well. So here you can see uh, the part of the midgut in normal flies with very nice long gastric cecal. Four hours later, the gastric seeks are retracted and the whole intestine is short uh, and, uh, and thick. And in the whole ATG8 gene mutant animal, this process is blocked. So the gastric seeks do not retract. 
Whereas in the glycine to stop codon mutant, which is equally impaired in autophagy, this process just happens normally. So it's another non-autophagic function of ATG, in this case of ATG8A. Now how about ATG8B? This is very interesting because ATG8A is expressed in all cells throughout of the fly. Whereas ATG8B is only expressed in the testis of male flies. And when we remove this gene from Drosophila, surprisingly, so ATG8B mutants uh, had no autophagy defects, not even in the testis, but they were male sterile. So all the other uh, autophagy mutants that we have, uh, homozygous mutants, are male fertile, right? all of these. But ATG8B mutants, are male sterile. And the problem is that when you mate a wild type male with a wild type female, the male will, of course, transmit the sperm cells to the female. In this case, we label the sperm cells green. So this is the female reproductive organ of a fly. And you can see that the sperm is already there in the female. But if we mate these wild type flies, females with a ATG8B mutant male, the sperm are not transmitted. Instead, all these sperm cells accumulate in the testis. They are just, uh, that's why these parts of the testis become really enlarged. Because all those sperm cells, which are, which are not able to swim properly, so these are kind of immobile sperm cells, they are stuck in the testis of mutant flies. And what's really, what is interesting for us, uh, it's a common technique to give back the wild type gene to a mutant. This is called a genetic rescue. And look whether the, if we add back the wild type gene, the phenotypes reverse to the wild type. So we, uh, if we end, add back the wild type gene to ATG8B knockouts, actually the, they become fertile, but the same thing happens, I think it's this column, the same thing happens if we remove the C-terminal glycine of the, this gene. It becomes fertile, male fertile again. again. Suggesting that it's again in, uh, not because of its autophagic function. It's very interesting, I just go back one slide. There is another Drosophila species, not Melanogaster, what we usually work with, but Obscura where even this part of ATGB8B is missing, suggesting, well, this is a, another proof coming via evolution. It has been lost, so it must not be important. So, yeah, this is the end of my uh, talk today. This, uh, I digged up a five-year-old picture of lab members so that I have all the people who worked on these. Half of the people are no longer with, with us. So not only in our cells, there is a continuous turnover of people in the labs as well. Vicky Kish was the one who was working on ATG9. Andre Zippa did the ATG8 studies. And um, Arindam Bhattacharya, a very talented postdoc from India, together with Adil Urmashi, a PhD student, did these uh, ubiquitin autophagy studies. So with that, uh, one more sentence. Actually, these are all side projects in, in my lab. So the main focus of the lab is to understand how autophagosomes fuse with lysosomes. So that's what most of the lab is doing. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so thank you for your speech. I would like to ask you that uh, too many autophagy in uh, cells uh, could cause any side effects? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, actually, too many of even good things is not so good. So they, uh, it's, it works like uh, many other things that there is an optimal amount of autophagic activity. And if it goes too high, the cells will die because they just overconsume themselves. But even before that, they won't uh, divide properly because it's kind of like a balance, if you think about it. So when cells grow and divide, they don't want to consume themselves, right? So when the cells are dividing rapidly and growing, then autophagy levels are usually low because the cell wants to grow and divide. But in resting cells, 
This is a so-called baseline autophagic activity. This is much higher because the cell is not growing, so it, it produces more breakdown. And this is especially important in cells which do not uh, divide, such as neurons. Any further questions? Yeah, um, uh, I just wanted uh, to ask one, uh, uh, one thing. This is a very nice presentation, and that's uh, uh, what happens uh, with uh, knockout mice? So um, uh, do they have the same phenotype, comparable pheno phenotypes as flies? Well, in, in, uh, I assume you are asking about the full body knockout mouse. Yes. So if you do uh, a full body knockout my, mouse, it still has autophagy protein provided by the mother in the oocyte because a lot of the proteins are deposited by the mother. This is so-called the maternal effect. Right? So these mice make it uh, until birth. But during birth, you lose the food supply from your mom. Right? Because the placenta is no longer there to, 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 to replenish you with food. So after birth, there is a so-called neonatal autophagy. If she, I guess most of you know that once a newborn uh, is outside, right, it loses like one kilogram of its weight in the first day. Because it has to start suckling, feeding milk. And, uh, you know, the intestine will need to start digesting and, uh, and kind of uh, feeding the animal. So there is a developmentally programmed starvation period in our life. And autophagy mutant mice uh, die during this. But also there are suckling defects because their brain is not working properly. And, and do you see the same phenotype in all autophagy gene knockout mice, or are there differences? Um, so uh, many of these autophagy genes are redundant in, uh, in uh, humans and mice. Of course, in those cases, there are like tissue-specific tissue roles. For the non-redundant genes, uh, it's pretty common uh, to produce this ne neonatal uh, death, but they have very severe neurological defects anyway after that. So even if you insert a tube in their stomach and try to feed them, they will die in a few days. But there are some autophagy genes that have very important other functions, for example, you know, endocytosis, and they will die during, I don't know, embryonic development. Thank you very much. Sure. So Actually, just one, one more okay. thing. So some, autoph some autophagy genes that have multiple homologs in humans, for example, those are most, more commonly mutated in people, causing neuro neuro neurological disease. So in these non-redundant autophagy genes, it's very rare to have mutations, like out of ATG5. It's just a point mutation, reducing activity. So those are critical. But some of these redundant genes, which have brain-specific uh, expression, that's where the GIVA studies uh, uh, isolate, uh, you know, gene variants that are linked to neuro neurodegeneration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabor, and uh, unfortunately that time is up and I still want to say a couple of words uh, as a farewell. Yeah. So we thank both speakers for the excellent lecture. I'm sure that they'll be sticking around afterwards. So if you were afraid to ask any questions in front of the audience, then you can do this in person. And on behalf of the National uh, uh, Academy <coughs> of Scientists Education, uh, I would like to close uh, the conference. Uh, and uh, you've attended the spring conference. This is mainly for 10th uh, graders. Uh, and this gives you an introduction uh, of the high school program. And I really encourage you to participate in the programs besides these conferences. And if you like this conference, uh, then you can take part in uh, the winter session in two years' time uh, before choosing the university. And until that time, you can actually uh, decide whether you uh, are interested in doing biomedical research. If so, uh, then uh, we would be really happy. And this is one of the main aims of the Academy. Uh, and the other thing that I would like to uh, tell you is that, as you've seen, that the conference's language is English, uh, and that's the language of, of science. So, so if you feel uh, that your English knowledge is uh, a bit behind, you still have at least two years 
before uh, the, uh, you know, at the university admission. So please take some time to, to learn uh, English uh, so you can then understand the language. Without this, uh, it will be difficult uh, to carry out a research career. And nowadays, I think it's a prerequisite anyway uh, to get into university. Uh, so your life will be much easier anyway, even if you don't do research, that you do uh, learn English. Uh, most of the scientific material in the world uh, uh, can be Googled in English rather than, than Hungarian. So um, uh, uh, with this, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this conference. Uh, we wish you farewell. Uh, hope to see you uh, in, in the programs. And uh, before you leave, uh, we invite you uh, to have lunch with us uh, in the atrium what we had in the very first day and the second day as well. Uh, and I, I wish you a good trip back home. Thank you very much.